I know you are quite interested in the Bulgarian scene and you are always out when they are musicians and stuff like that. Can you compare the two countries in some way? I, it's sure. impossible. Yeah, yeah well, there, there's so much, one is so much bigger with so many more people. Um, but I, I would say, and I think that we talked about this earlier, was that uh, especially in, in rock and sort of pop music, uh, but more in like rock music, in the United States, you kind of have two sort of groups of people. Yeah. You have people who want to go see original music, and they go to a certain set of music venues, which are usually bands, or uh, bars that have bands and stages and stuff, and you'll have two or three or four bands Thursday, Friday, Saturday night usually and they're playing original music and they don't really play many cover songs you know, other people's music, they play, might play one or two and they'll do a big an interpretation of that song instead of trying to play it much like the original. Mm -hmm. And then you have places that are like the neighborhood bar that has a band that's always the same few people and they play this and they just play cover songs and you have a group of people who go to that kind of Thing. And those, those are kind of separate. They're not really. They don't mix much. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed in Bulgaria is that uh, there's not a group of fans or people that are looking for the the next. Who's the next good band? You know, and if 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 you're this kind of person in the United States, if you're not a musician, but you know, you, you can say, oh, the other week, you know, I was with my friends and we saw this band and they're really cool and they had this new song. I can't remember who they are, but I'm going to keep watching them, you know, and then they're, they want to go, oh, I remember when those guys who are now famous were like nobody, because I went to see them in this, this bar, you know, and here, what I notice is that even if you have a band that writes original music, that you'll go to play a place, and it's very difficult, you're doing it just for the money, and if you, and you have to play other people's music, mm -hmm. and the audience is expecting you to play it exactly like, or as, as exactly like they hear it on the radio. And then you, they throw in one or two or three of their own original songs, hoping that the audience will like them, or at least not go, "What is that? I haven't heard that. I don't. I don't care about that." And I think that, that's a bit depressing. I hope that's going to change, but I think that that requires that that requires a lot of work on both the the bands and the audience's part. And you know what it does require is it requires. Uh, the schools requires music teachers requires that because there's a direct relationship in the United States I can see this for sure that uh, that the quality of music went down when the people listening to the music were willing to accept bad music mm -hmm. and the yes. only way that you accept bad music is if you don't have any music education you know so are you willing to accept some contest winner who has a song written for them who's mostly they're just lip syncing or they're being auto-tuned and they're not really talented, they just look good and they're part of a corporate machine. They can dance, they got right. a good body. Yeah. Right, <laughs> but if, if, you know, when I was in, in high school and in, in elementary school, everybody had to go to music class. And you didn't have to become a musician, but you had to at least learn that this is how difficult it is to play an instrument and this is what music is, this is how it works, this is how it's structured, it's based on there's mathematical parts and you know the basics mm -hmm. of music everybody had to learn that with and the instrument trying to yeah, play instrument yeah not just that but also sort of musical and art appreciation and then later in the what do you mean about musical appreciation Sorry. like uh, you know like not just how not just how to play not everybody has to learn to play flute and everybody has to join band for you know uh -huh. a semester or something but also like you know uh there were classes about like musical and art appreciation, like this is this artist and this is this kind of, uh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and then in the late 80s, or I would say actually in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of the funding in the univer in, in lower education uh, in the United States went away. And so what they started cutting was arts. They didn't cut sports ever. No. You know, they kept all the football teams, but they started cutting the money. <laughs> art class and music class. And then, and then what you see, direct relationship about eight or ten years after that, is that all the kids who come out of school with no arts education at all, and then you give them some really bad piece of music on the radio, and yes, they don't, and they can't like you and I go, that sucks. They go, oh, I like that. That's cool. Yeah. You know, because because <laughs> they they don't know. You know, and it's so it's. And Shall so, we say that's all around the world? That's all around the world. 
and it but it just manifests Sad. itself in in things like uh, chaga and yeah. you know really bad country western music from the United States. I mean, there's good country western music. There's like yeah, yeah. there's bluegrass and stuff like that, which is yeah. actually quite difficult to play and yeah. it's very different. So then there's yeah. then there's like your you know really really hokey country western music, which is much more. It's like the American chaga, if you want to think of it that way. You know? yeah, okay. So. I, I, those things are related. So, so having having music class and having music teachers and having art classes, uh, what could be more important than that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, how how do you get famous in United States? Oh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Uh, yeah, but in the old days, sorry, yeah, yeah. in the old days, at least what I read, read, uh, they play in some bar. There's some. What do you call it? Air men. A and R. Era. A A and R. A and R. Yeah. yeah. And wow, they they okay. Let's bring them in the studio. Yeah. We find the producer, play the music. Yeah. Now it's not like that. Not We like that to... at all anymore. No, now it's well, a. Well, what the rock bands are going to do? Uh, well, just playing the bars. Nowadays, Try. nowadays it's. I mean, it's all about online. Uh, representation you know it's, it's about having your music video on YouTube and being on Spotify and all that kind of stuff um, and sadly so you don't you don't you don't have any you're not going to get a record deal from a record label until you've already become somewhat famous online you know because what's the point yeah exactly uh, and by the time you've done that you probably don't need one exactly yeah um, unless you're going to go on tour and then tours are making money off merchandise you know um, and not so much record sales because record sales aren't really don't because nobody buys records and don't really nobody drive buys records there everything is, on Spotify or yeah. Apple Music Google Music yeah. there is a current resurgence of uh, vinyl and even cassette tapes that are starting to mm -hmm. come out but again it's a, it's a smaller market specialty yeah. kind of thing and then but really it's all about uh, protecting your publishing rights So you're, if you write original music, you've got to you've got to protect your publishing rights. You've got to register that you've copywritten all those songs, and then you've got to register with the companies that basically police the internet. So there's, uh, you know, there's systems that go out on the internet and, and through YouTube and all these other places, and 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 use algorithms to find your music, and yeah. then and then they. They do either. They, what they can do is demonetize somebody else's video. Like if you use, if they use your song in their video without your permission, mm -hmm. then you've got to get paid for it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Or oh, uh, they put commercial on the video, stuff like that. Right. Going so there's a complex, a yeah. very complex series of that, and so, and you know, as a musician, as an artist, having to be able to understand all the intricacies of digital publishing rights is pretty hard, you know. And it's difficult to hire a lawyer because they're expensive. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's it's not so much about lawyers nowadays. It's more about the fact that you've got to chase down all these companies that are supposed to be keeping track of revenue streams, you know, from different digital streaming. And and the laws, of course, aren't up to like the the laws about um, publishing aren't are, are very complicated, but they were written. You know, 30 years ago, and they were updated maybe 15 years ago, and they don't, you know, far behind the. Yeah, now yeah. it's so dynamic. Everything. Right, and there's a difference between performance royalties and you know, like uh, static, like records and objects. You know, so there's a difference, and and how you translate that into the modern online world is, you know, very weird and complex because you know it used to be like well if a thing like a CD or a record or a tape is an actual physical thing you can buy it you know you give this money and you buy it and then but listening to that thing over the radio is a different thing yeah. and so now the difference is well streaming it over a streaming site is more like they apply the rules for radio yeah. but downloading a file they apply the rules for buying an object and then every incantation in between so The complexity is yeah. even, uh, and I'm, you know, certainly not the pl person to be giving a lecture about it, but it's definitely extremely complicated. So making, making your way in, in the world to become famous is definitely, a, it's, it's a very different, you know. You're not going to do it with only an audio track. You'd have to have, you know, 
Yeah, because you're social. not gonna, you're not going to get that song played unless you've got a video. Because it's really got to get up on YouTube, yeah. and then it's you know, and you've got it. So how it gets driven is is tough, and that's that's not even something I'm really good at. I, I'm more in the let's let's make it. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're right now producing a Bulgarian band. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a little about it? What means producing? Because many of the kids, you know, or, or even the people, they think uh, 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 about the producer as a man or, or lady with the money sure. making the producing. And why you are producing a Bulgarian band? It's not actually a Bulgarian band, but you can tell the story. Right. How you met them, what Wait, you Well, uh, I mean, this producers are a word of a lot of vague descriptions. So, uh, I mean, a producer could be someone who provides money, or it could be somebody who's been hired by a record company, or it could be someone hired by the artists, the band themselves. Um, and it could be somebody who's... You know, if, if someone... If, if, if the artist is an, like an individual or a duo, you know, and... And they're they're working with the producer. Then the producer is usually more involved in songwriting, and um, and pr producing like an entire sort of production and management of someone's career to some degree. Mm -hmm. But if you have a band, especially like a rock band that that is writing their own songs and they're writing their own parts, and they come with completed songs, then the producer's role is a bit different. You know, you're not really gonna write their songs for them you, what you need to do is to be the outside person who with more experience who knows how to say this is a great good song let's make it a great song what do we do to do that and working with the band to try to figure out what the parts are you know uh, does the song need to be simplified does it need to be shortened does it need to have um, does it need to have a break added to it uh, you know is it too complicated for the average listener to approach or You know, is it in the wrong time signature or something, you know, speed yeah. or something, all these kinds of things. Um, a lot of it, again, depending on how how good the band is and how talented they are as musicians, is um, someone who's willing to say, let's try this and let's try this, let's try 50 things that, and 40 of them won't work, you know, but just to try to, to you know, to, to push them outside of their realm of... Uh, how to think about the stuff that they've done so that they can really like take it and come back together uh, this this current band they're called the Maze Hunters and uh, the guitar player who's the newest guy in the band he's Bulgarian from Sofia and uh, the singer's uh, from Ukraine and the drummer is from Transnistria which is between Ukraine and Moldova the bass player's from Moldova but they all the three of them came to Sofia to go to university yeah. so they speak Russian and English and Bulgarian, and uh, and their songs are in English and they have original songs. So I saw them playing some months ago and thought, wow, they have really good songs and they have a good look and I mean, uh, and they play well together even though they We're were talking very again about the look. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, not like yeah. like in a teeny bopper kind of look, yeah, but I mean like the stage, they, yeah. but I mean they don't like you don't look at them and go, oh, this person doesn't fit. You know what I mean? Like they weren't yeah. that kind Sorry. of. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, like. They're all in their 20s instead of, you know, there being like one guy who's in who's 20 and three guys that are 40s, that, that, you know, which also would seem a little weird. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're, they had really good songs and good energy, you know, and the singer has a really, uh, really interesting voice. Like he, um, he's got kind of a, like a Chris Cornell kind of voice, like a really like powerful uh, voice that really mm -hmm. cuts through. And uh, and he and he's his since he's not a native English speaker. One of the things that I've been doing is hel helping fix their English um, to make you know the, make the the words flow a little bit better in English. You know, sometimes we get um, you know things have to be fixed that they didn't think about, and and sometimes there's a lot of happy accidents that happen in the translation. You know, to English, so co just cool sentence structure that you wouldn't think of. That goes, oh, that's that's a cool way to say that. So yeah, let's keep that. You know, let's fix this. So yes, we spent um, a couple of weeks ago. We spent a week um, or five days tracking five songs, and it's not like one song per day. Of course, you most of the songs are similar. So mm -hmm. and uh, so you know, we set it all up. Spent a couple of days, most about a day and a half, getting sounds, drum sounds, guitar sounds, bass sounds, and then cut five tracks live. Um, where you're 
your most important thing you're caring about is getting the drums, getting the bass, you know, because you're probably going to overdub the guitars and you're going to overdub the vocals. Yeah. And you don't really want um, the guitars and the vocals leaking into the, into the room mics of the drum, you know. Uh, and hopefully that your rhythm section, your bass player and your drummer are tight enough and, uh, and good enough that um, the bass player is not... N neither one of them are making mistakes. What you really want to do is get a, get a drum track that sounds great and doesn't have any major mistakes or, you know, and everybody's happy with it. It's not going up and down in time. It's, um, you know, all the hits are good. And then... And then if you're tracking live and, and the bass is in the same physical space where the, the bass is going to bleed into the room mic of the drum, which it's going to, yeah, um, of course. then your bass player also has to have a good cut. Like he can't hit a wrong note all the way no through. Wrong notes. He, he could hit a wrong note or he or she could hit a wrong note as long as it's maybe in the key and in time. In the key. You know, and it sounds okay. Yeah. Um, but it might not have been like the same note that they always do. But if it's a really weird one, you won't be able to edit it out of the drums. Now, there's lots of ways to record, you know, you can put the drums in a completely isolated room and yeah. put all the instruments in an isolated room in each person, but... But you miss the energy. Right, it's a different... The, well, yeah, the, that, that requires two things. One, it requires that the, the people in the, in the band have experience in the studio. The more experience you have in the studio, the more use you are to this very weird thing of, okay, I'm in, a, in this room, I have headphones on, I probably can't see the other people in the band, there's some microphones and start the song, you know? And this is kind of akin to saying someone like, telling someone to paint a picture who's a, who's a great artist and say, okay, uh, you know, I'm gonna stand over here and just tell me where to paint and just yell the, you know? So it's like you try to, you separate the artist so much, it's very hard to get the art out. Mm -hmm. It takes lots of studio experience before the artist can just walk into a studio and sit down and go, no problem, I can play that and it'll be great. And that's what they call a studio musician. Yeah. You know, and those guys, women, they get paid a lot of money And they usually come, they don't usually, uh, you know, they, get, they come into where you have a, usually an individual artist, you know. They don't usually come into a band situation too often unless one of the people in the band is, is really subpar in their instrument. But, uh, you know, they'll come in and sit down and be great, but they've spent thousands and thousands of hours in the studio, you know. So it's yeah. better initially to put a band or a group in the same physical space where they can all see each other and they can all hear each other and track and try to get a good drum and bass take and not turn the guitar amps up super loud um, and then later come back and record the guitars and then you can turn the guitar amps up really loud because you're recording them without having, you know, worrying about bleed in. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so we did that for a week and then we had the singer come back uh, for a couple of days, two weeks yeah. later, and to, to track lead vocals and now I'm in the process of mixing that. So. Can you tell about your uh, recording technique? What, what kind of equipment you got? It's not a traditional studio, it's just recording in a house, but uh, lots of really big records have been recorded in houses. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Traveling Wilburys, this is the super group with Tom Petty and, oh, yeah. Tom. and uh, Bob Dylan and George Harrison and uh, Jeff Lynne and Roy Orbison, you know, and they put out three records. But that, their first, second and third record recorded Bob Dylan's house. You know, like he just had recording gear in the house and they just yeah. set up in the kitchen, you know. And uh, uh, Sweet Dreams yeah. is recorded on the, on, the, on the attic Yeah, with eight Yeah, yeah tracks. so Yeah, so uh, recorded it uh, half-inch reel-to-reel analog tape, eight-track. Uh, and, you know, all the Beatles records are recorded in four and eight-track. So if you, can't, if you can't do it in eight-tracks, you can't really do it. That's the thing, you know. Uh, and if you've got more than eight kind of different sounds all at once it becomes really difficult to mix it and for someone to listen to it and go mm -hmm. that this doesn't sound like a bunch of junk yeah it's different you know if you're recording a symphony orchestra well that's you know more than 50 instruments but but that's a very different thing because it's orchestrated so that all these things play perfectly together and it creates you know and the composer has done that but in in a rock kind of band setting you start to get a lot of really loud instruments and, you, and then you start to record lots of stuff, many, many tracks of things, you try to put them together and it just sounds like it's just too much stuff. It just, just yeah, Think about if you yeah. record a, a symphony orchestra, you use stereo yeah. mic. Yeah, absolutely. You don't use 50 mics for, every, right. for each instrument. Also. Yeah, and, and this is, this is uh, also part of the, part of the, 
the thing, you know, a recording engineer used to be, and the original recording engineer was a, a person whose job it was to uh, put all the musicians in a room, one room, and then put one microphone, because that's what they had, one microphone that had no pattern, it was an omnidirectional microphone, yeah. in the room, and then there was a band leader, you know, and then he had, in the control room, they would have a volume knob, right? And they might have bass and treble. Later on, they had bass and treble. And then they were cutting it to a, to a record or to a, a wire, a wire mm -hmm. roll. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a mono recording with one microphone and no compression and no equalization. And the job of the recording engineer was to move the musicians in the room closer to the microphone until the mix was right. Yeah. And then to talk to the band leader and the band leader you know, the conductor, to, to be able to tell, oh, when the singers step up, you know, you step up to the microphone this far away, and then in this part of the verse you step back, you know, and you sing this loud, you know, and that was recording engineering. It was about proximity to the microphone, and, and that's what it was. And now we've gone so far the other direction that, you know, it's 50 microphones on everything yeah. and 500 tracks, and... So I'm trying to get back to this... Um, to the basic. Yeah, trying to get back to where, you know, if, if it sounds good, you know, if, if the person can play, they're playing instrument well, uh, and it sounds good in the room, you should be able to set up a microphone where you're standing, right? And, and turn it on and do nothing and have it sound good, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then move the microphone around to, to try to get it. You know? So we did drum sounds with having the drummer play set up in the drum room and then I had head I had the speak the speakers on and headphones on uh, sometimes and the control room door closed and I had one of the guys from the band wear headphones on a long extension cable and had him hold the microphone and just told him okay walk around the room slowly put the mic in different places one microphone and then I would say stop you know and then I would go in there and like where are you okay put the microphone right there you know, and we would do that until, and we ended up with the microphone above the open doorway, this far from the corner, and that's most of the drum sound. That's one microphone. It just happens to be in the right spot. Really? Yeah. And then another mic on the kick, kick drum, and another mic on the snare drum, so that. So that's your room mic. Yeah, the there, room microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I I didn't know where it was. I was just having him walk around. Okay. And, you know, until we we tried a dozen places, and then. Strange. You know. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you know. The best song is there. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's three microphones on the drums, you know, and you would you would also mic the kick and the snare for the reason is later on the two things you're gonna want to be able to control a lot mm -hmm. are kick and snare, really, which is especially the, most, the kick, yeah, actually especially the the snare really yeah? because okay. um, when you listen to music, the the loudest two things you ever hear are the vocals, the lead vocal and the snare drum, you know, so you want to be able to sort of have individual control over kick and snare, and uh, and as this, is, this isn't something that I like to do it's better to have a good drum sound it's better to have a good music, instrument sound but if you get to a place where you need to do uh, sound replacing which is the, you know, the process of, of turning that into digital and then taking each uh, place that the drum has been hit and replacing it with another waveform mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you could do that for an effect to change the sound of a part or you could do that to for to replace a a bad sounding snare drum, mm -hmm. or uh, or ho hopefully not an inconsistent drummer, and you can tell you can tell when you watch a drummer. You know, you sh it's always good to walk around the back of the stage and look at the drummer, and watch where they hit the drum, and you can tell a good drummer and a bad drummer because a good drummer it's it doesn't just keep really good time, but they consistently hit that snare drum. In, the, in that part of the song, almost exactly the same way. You know, it'll, it's moving around mm -hmm. that far, and they're not looking at it, you know? And that's, that's a big thing. And sometimes you record a drummer, and they have bad consistency. Yeah. And you can, you know, if you're recording analog, you, you, you can hear it. If you're recording digital, you can actually see it. Mm -hmm. 